Hello, and welcome to the featured speaker session with Mrs. Loretta Parham at Total Radical Imagination. My name is Dr. Tawana Nevels, board chair for the HBCU Library Alliance and director of library services at St. Augustine's University. I'll be moderating today's session. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to remind attendees we'll be following the Digital Library Federation Code of Conduct, which we'll place in the chat. Audience members, if you have questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom client. We will turn to questions and answers at the 40 minute mark at about, at this 50 minute session. So now I am excited to introduce our featured speaker, Mrs. Loretta Parham, who is the CEO and Library Director of the Incorporated Atlanta University Center Woodruff Library, an entity shared by four HBCU institutions, Clark Atlanta University, the Interdenominational Theologic Center, Morehouse College, and Spelman College. Mrs. Parham wears many hats. She is the co-founder and past chair of the HBCU Library Alliance. She is a past chair of the Georgia Humanities Council. She's a former board chair of the Association of College and Research Libraries, former trustee of OCLC Incorporated, past chair of the ALA Committee on Accreditation, and an officer in many other organizations. She's an active member, scholar, and engaging speaker who was named ACRL 2017 Academic Research Librarian of the Year, a 2016 Distinguished Alumna of the University of Michigan School of Information Science, a mover and shaker by the Industry Publication Library Journal. She has authored articles, one of which um, where she co-authored a book called Achieving Diversity, a how to do it manual for librarians and served as faculty for Educause Management Institute. Mrs. Parham is currently on the Educopia board She's a member of the University of Michigan Information School Alumni Advisory Board, the WABE NPR Advisory Council, and a member of the Roundtable for Aligning Initiatives for Open Science of the National Academics of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Mrs. Parham, thank you so much for being with us today. What will you be sharing with us today? I'm gonna talk um, about HBCUs, about really kind of issues which are germane to leadership. Can I begin? Okay. Well, I'm gonna hand the floor over to you at this time. Thank you very much. And good morning or good evening to everyone that is joining us today. I love this title, Toward Radical Imagination. And um, I must say that's a rather risky title, to, uh, and topic to assign to me, because this term radical means to believe or express the belief that there should be great or extreme social or political change, something very new and different from what is traditional or ordinary, someone who has very extreme views, a person or party who advocates thorough or complete political or social reform. So how radical are they who stormed, vandalized, and assaulted people on the steps of the U.S. Capitol just a couple years ago? How radical were the actions of officers given the arms and legal protections to assault and kill individuals for minor or non-existing violations? How radical is it to create ordinances that limit exposure to the histories of African-American people or to the histories of the queer community or to women's history? or to the indigenous people's history, to Jewish histories and more. How radical is it to support the, the protestations of one person about a book over the rights of all people 
deserving access to that book. How radical must it have been to give land to some white missionaries and educators and abolitionists and freedmen wanting to establish schools for a population formed for purposes of capitalism? Can you imagine what the Twitter remarks would have been in the early 18 and 1900s when word got out that someone was actually going to teach Blacks to read and write? And imagine more of the reaction when those Blacks provided cognitive evidence of innate and learned skills to write and research materials for the development and delivery of curriculum in those early institutions and normal schools. Curriculum that is still a landing place for ethnic and African-American studies. Lifting some quotes from this article titled Counter Memory and Race and authored by Anthony Brown, he shares that African-American scholars during the early 1900s encountered, countered rather, the explicit and implicit imagery of African-Americans. These scholars found that typical historical school knowledge often silenced, omitted, truncated, or inaccurately rendered African-Americans' historical experiences. Numerous scholars from the 19th century to the present have consistently challenged the dominant historical narratives found in scholarly and educational discourse and help to create new historical knowledge about African-Americans. Does this at all sound familiar? Or that the reaction and correction to these mythical narratives were radical at that time, even now? During the early part of the 20th century, the textbook was an essential apparatus in education. Today, that apparatus is being replaced with textbooks written sometimes without formal peer review or peer pressure open educational resources that are called from individual scholarship and experiences and the collections of academic and learned societies. Returning to the article, Counter Memory and Race, Brown went on to say that scholars such as Arthur Schomburg, W.E.B. Du Bois, Carter G. Woodson, Anna Bontemps, Charles Wesley, Horace Mann Bond and William Hansberry and more, understood that African-American history could not simply be additive text to the official knowledge. Those scholars understood that the reconstruction of the African-American image required a level of historical and empirical rigor to challenge the normative constructions of, of African-American life. The scholars' insistence on using historical rigor were purposefully employed using innovations such as historical analysis, text, and photographs to document the histories of African-Americans with the sole intent to reconstruct African-American history and imagery. The histories of the HBCU schools, such as the infamous HUs, I have to say that, because I want to talk about, that is Hampton University versus Howard University. Those who know, know. Cheney, established in 1837 and the oldest HBCU still in operation. Um, also Tuskegee, home of the Tuskegee Airmen and also the site of the syphilis study of 1932. Of Spelman College, named in honor of a Rockefeller family member and endowed with the wealth of that family. And Fisk University as another example celebrated for their innovative marketing strategy to gain more resources and visibility by sending talented musicians on road trips around the country, notably the Fisk Jubilee Singers. These histories are so vastly different from the history and founding purposes of other institutions like UGA, University of Georgia, University of Michigan, Wellesley, Emory, or other PWIs, uh, predominantly white institutions, to name but a few. This HBCU history includes so many stories and notes about individuals, missionaries, freed slaves and churches and communities that deserve the credit for establishing what is now known as an HBCU. Institutions and normal schools founded for the sole purpose of education and vocational training for the disenfranchised, for the freed persons, former slaves, 
and for the Native American, the indigenous people of this country who were so radically uprooted. This history of the HBCU is different. And it is these HBCUs, HBCUs that hold today on our shelves and in our vaults and in our special collections, we hold the moving and historical account of the driven individuals who were fated to be educated and to educate. In 2001, it was interesting, the interim president of NAFIO, which is the National Association for Equal Opportunity in Higher Education, explained in an editorial that the concept of the Black college goes beyond racial composition of its student body and faculty. It is a concept that is rooted in history. He discusses the major stages of the education and development of schools for Blacks and describes these stages as the stage of, as the establishment of institutions by abolitionists in the Northern states to a period of federal encouragement of black institutions to one of forced segregation and resource deprivation to the period of civil rights and desegregation to a period of enhancement when black colleges are acknowledged as positive instruments and then now as institutions that are encouraged as promoters of our cultural identity. We are culture keepers. Yet as we know throughout these periods, there was little interest by outsiders in assembling and preserving the instruments of educational innovation. That is historical analysis, text and photographs and later audio. In 2002, a plan of action was created, some of you know this story, and agreed to by a group of library directors at a meeting of HBCU library directors and deans. For the record, I must say that much credit for that meeting that is not often heard must be given to Kate Nevins, the then executive director of SolarNet, which was a network of OCLC at the time. And you now know it as Lyricist. Her support of those early meetings was a grand act in support of DEI before anyone knew what that acronym was. When that organization and its board and the Mellon Foundation funded the attendance of 101 librarians to a meeting in Atlanta for three days. That's how this HBCU Library Alliance was born. The plan of action documented at that time by Dr. Janice Franklin of Alabama State University, who is also a co-founder of this alliance, was the guiding value statement for the creation of the HBCU Library Organization. The organization would be later incorporated as the HBCU Library Alliance. The plan says that HBCU libraries hold rich collections of books, photographs, pamphlets, newspapers, letters, and other cultural materials that have significant value to faculty researchers, students, and society as a whole. But may not those materials may not be known or accessible to those who have need or interest in them. Now, we said that in 2002. This is now 2023. Maintaining the historical context and integrity of these valuable collections to our institutions is a primary consideration while providing increased access Many of these materials need stabilization and improved storage. We thought that cooperative action among the HBCU libraries could improve preservation, maintain integrity of materials, establish value, and enhance access to special collections and advance their use, most important, their use in research, excuse me, please teaching and learning opportunities. So why did I take us down this review of the past? Because it's important information, because it can't be said enough times, and because it helps to establish context for really why 
this community is here. So when invited to speak today, it was suggested that I offer comment about what has changed for HBCUs since 2017, which is when the last DLF conference with the Alliance was held. And I spoke at that particular conference. And I was asked to comment about what the opportunities and challenges are for digital library work at an HBCU. My initial reaction was to say, not much. But then I had to rethink that and acknowledge all the, the work that's been done recently, resulting from partnerships, from passion, energy, commitment with other institutions of higher education and within the Alliance and with nonprofit organizations that are focused on access and preservation. So partners such as Cornell University or the University of Georgia, Emory University, Brown University, the University of Delaware, yay, and now of late Harvard University, and of course, CLEAR, DLF, and let's all applaud the Mellon Foundation. Much has been achieved, so much, and you can visit the HBCU Library Alliance website to get information about so many projects. But I also must say that in too many cases, the challenges of 2017, 2007, 1967, 1957, 47, and 37 remain the same. Inadequate, an inequitable distribution of resources and a lack of vision for and by the library and archives on so many of our campuses remain a challenge. I don't think this observation is unique, however. Inadequate resources and advocacy is more common than we think. Lack of ad advocacy, I must say, is more common than we think. But it is inequitable and extremely uneven when one looks closely at the HBCUs. Now, I'm not going to give you the data, but you can, we are all in the field, you can find the data. You can look at state resources and see up until yesterday how PWI public institutions receive a larger share based up than the HBCU public institution. That inadequacy, that lack of resources was something that was grown over the many, many years. Not the growth of resources, the growth of inadequate resources. Catching up is certainly one significant challenge that we have. Another, is the assumption made that we lack capacity. And then there is the history of other institutions using their resources to take advantage of an HBCU and its collections. So mistrust is historical and trust remains a huge challenge today. In March of 2022, as we were all rolling over from a two-year period of disruption in our lives, CLEAR published the results of a focus group study conducted in partnership with the HBCU LA. I must admit, I finally read the report just a couple of weeks ago, cover to cover. And it is quite confirming. It answers many questions. And I know that this uh, publication will be discussed in more detail uh, over the course of this particular conference. But I do wanna share briefly with you here, as I believe the panel that follows me as they provide more detail, um, perhaps will launch from these comments or add and create their own. So what has changed for HBCU since 2017? And what are the opportunities? for digital library work at an HBCU. 
So opportunity in this report, they talk about the significance of collections, the, the, the opportunity to contribute to scholarship on civil rights, scholarship on, on the social justice movement, which we have all been making efforts to collect these um, primary resources in our, in our collections. The report talks about the challenge in management and capacity, physical space needs, staff shortages, inadequate allocations from operating funds that impact staff, equipment, and space, and shared values sometimes in principle, but not in practice. The study revealed the highest priorities, needs, and aspirations, and those turned out to be staff and space, digitization and preparation for digitization, responding to workplace demands, communications and visibility about collections, education for administrators, my word, coaching, DEI in action. I'll pause there to say, DEI is about the individual, but it is also about the organization. I think that organizations that still pass on membership dues level to organizations that do not have comparable resources with, with one another, membership dues that are far out of scale for our institutions, that is not support of DEI. It is not. And I think that our professional organizations really, really should go into a side room and think about how we are helping our institutions in addition to inserting and using language and text. I'm sorry, but I think DEI has to go deeper than that. The CLEAR study concludes with at least several recommendations, recommendation, but two in general, to educate administrators so that they will invest in archives and special collections and to continue the conversation captured by the focus group in the study within the HBCU community. I have no doubt that this latter recommendation about continuing the conversation will occur within the HBCU Library Alliance. We talk all the time and we are motivated in these days to talk more. But I would add a few more recommendations and suggest that they are executed with a flavor of radical imagination. My additions, well, this is when I'll do a share screen. So let's see how my tech, technology uh, skills work out. So my, my additions to the recommendations for HBCUs and institutions serving BIPOC and, P and PWI institutions is one, professional development. We need to commit heavily, I believe, as, as care culture keepers, caretakers of these collections, and as managers and supervisors of the talent and skilled staff that we hire, we need to commit in a greater way to professional development. We need, we need this in terms of technical processes, um, particularly organization preservation platforms and born digital. And we need this across the community of people of color. We need to do this to make sure that we do not create isolated camps within our library organizations where diversity may not show itself in some of those isolated areas because of our concern about knowledge, et cetera, with regard to technical processes. We need professional development on policy and how we can influence access to collection. We have to do more than sit at our desk. This is a get up, get out of your office and go up to the president's office, the provost's office. This is a go off the campus into the community and help to advocate for policy that will improve access to our collections. This policy advocating for that can result in, in you know, the dollars that can, but I think just recently Southern University received um, $3 million, I believe, so that they can um, improve the Wi-Fi across the entire campus. That's the kind of professional development results we can um, 
we should anticipate that we should look for it. Professional development, of course, on grant writing, implementation, and fiscal management. It's not enough to write those grants. We have to know how to manage the finances in the grant. The strength of our, our capacity to do that is what will give donors the confidence to invest and reinvest with us. Adding archives to the curriculum, this under presidential and provost curriculum, I believe after reading that report that somehow or another we need to try and influence Harvard Graduate School of Education and CLEAR to insert into the curriculum of their uh, programs for new presidents and new provosts. They need to uh, insert something that talks about the value of archives and special collections and talks about how those collections, those departments can help that president to advance his or her agenda for the institution. I think if they hear it from somewhere else, they might start to believe it. And then when they hear it again from you and I, maybe they'll move a little closer to being the kind of ally that's needed in this effort. Bridge building. Someone on my staff recently went to the ACR, Jessica Epstein, she went to the ACR meeting and she was in Pittsburgh and, and she was just so intrigued by the 456 bridges in, in uh, Pittsburgh. And she related that to our work and the value of building bridges. Bridges between librarians and faculty, between library, website and our users, between librarians and students, between libraries and books, campus bookstores, uh, and between the library and community. Repurposing of space. We certainly um, have an opportunity to do that as libraries continue the trend of moving more toward the delivery of do, doing better and doing more with services as opposed to growing our collections at the rate of previous years. We also want to be able, I believe, to contribute to the professional literature, because again, it's about helping to build value, and it's about helping those outside, uh, outside of our office doors to understand what the archives and the special collections and access to those collections, what that can contribute to community, whether it's the campus community, the local community, or the national community, or the international community. I think we also need to plan for our response uh, to the expectations of the millennial and Gen Z workers, and now this new group, Generation Alpha, Workers. Have you heard about this group? They are born in 2010 to 2024. Um, and quite honestly, beginning in five years, Generation Alpha will land on, on our campus doorsteps or on our campus Wi-Fi networks. I personally am struggling with the idea of, of not keeping my albums and CDs, something that, you know, this, this, the, newest generation have no idea. You know, I still have concern that I'm not supposed to wear an analog watch, but wear a digital watch instead. And also, my notes tell me that I shouldn't be carrying credit cards anymore but I should be using digital wallet instead. This is what students expect. And if they expect it and get it outside the campus, then we must be ready to provide it on the campus. And we must be ready to provide it in our libraries. It's not enough that student affairs is doing all these wonderful things. We must be doing the same thing, creating that same innovation and access and using that same radical thinking and imagination in our libraries. We must also become early adopters of technology. Sometimes we don't plan for the use of technology very well. It has to involve more people. A little side story I'll tell you about employing 
early adoption of technology. So some years ago, I think it was in 2013, I read something about, you know, I guess it was the start of AI about robots. And um, I convinced at that time, staff, we bought, I bought, asked someone, I said, buy this robot. We bought a little robot. And some of you perhaps may be familiar with it. Um, it was something that could be controlled so that it could hear you, it could see you, and you could respond to it. Well, you weren't, it, but some librarian in another location in the building who was looking at a screen, much like we're all looking at computers today, was kind of controlling this robot. I was so excited about this. Um, we had a contest test and the students named the robot and we called it Sparkmore. And the wrote the Sparkmore became an assistant in the stats for us. This mobile presence was there. So we early adopted the technology. What failed to do was to bring about the need for change in thinking about support and assistance to students. Because at that time, many of the staff, I, I received pushback because the idea of some mechanical device providing support, I think was just, um, they were not quite ready to accept that change in the positioning of the library reference and circulation support. But now we know we can no longer afford to be hesitant. We can no longer afford to pause. We must get ahead of our colleagues on the campuses. If we want value in our library and in our archives and special collections, then we have to demonstrate that we are willing to innovate and bring these things to the students and to the faculty. We must be willing to face change and use it to our advantage. We need to recognize the value of adopting the new language for workplace and for use in managing collections and people. We must, in terms of people, we must have flexibility. Um, flexibility to create, and support a hybrid workplace. Now, I know that is a challenge at every institution. Some of us have more capacity to control that than others. But I would say, even if the institution says no, what can you do within your physical library and archives? As a profession for years, we have really been working with flexible schedules forever. We, we really have. We have been working with the shifts and reassigning people to work different shifts based upon need. So I think we need to get creative. If we can't do what corporate America is doing, then think about what we can do in the space that is given. Mrs. Parham? Yes. We have about four minutes before Q&A. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. So with that, I will go on. This will be interesting. So you may only get to see one. Oh, there you go. See those slide. Okay, good. So when you think about the digital workplace, talking about corporate America, these are the things that they say that we are all facing in our workplace. And we are. Complexity. And what that refers to are the multiple software packages and platforms that don't work together. So we all have them in this digital workplace, and, and those of you that are more skilled in this area can talk about it. We have platform upon platform, and it is really time for us to reduce that complexity of how those uh, management, those virtual management tools work to support our work, but that's an investment in resources. Uncertainty, the whole issue about top-down solving of unique issues without a play copy. Disengage remote workers who are disconnected from the workplace. We must give much, much, much attention to that. I would say that there can't be remote work for everyone. It's just, it doesn't work in this profession. But there are some ways that we can make it work within our libraries. The fear of change. The response to change has to be modeled by managers. So employees will walk this way. And lack of alignment. This is where we have silos. 
within our institution that create gaps in communications, resulting in a lack of alignment. The digital work we are discussing is just another way to deliver on our commitment and mission regarding information and access. I would say to my colleagues in other HBCUs and to my colleagues in PWIs, don't get it twisted and don't shy away from something that sounds and is challenging, foreign, or formidable. Unless the archives and special collections are tied to academic programs or accreditation, there appears to be little indication that their level of priority will improve. This is so true. It is our job to make what we do and to make the resources we have and, and our staff to tie the value to the institution's academic program or to accreditation. To not do that, means that we will not get the support that we certainly need and expect. So we achieve by partnering, we achieve through collaboration, we achieve by building bridges and crossing them, even if it means holding the handrail all the way across. Whether it is innovative or radical, as long as we are flexible and collaborative and authentic. And again, those histories and evidences created during a period of historical rigor are stored in our institutions on paper and in the cloud. That culture is ours to care for. It is a tremendous and special privilege to be so interested. Thank you. Thank you so much for this topic. Um, I have been super excited listening to some of the nuggets that you talked about. Um, I would want to remind our audience that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A section of the portal and I will address those as they come in. But I do have a question for you now. As a library director, um, a number of our special collections have this unique opportunity to tie back to, as you mentioned, accreditation. For instance, we have a uh, religious studies um, department. And what we know about the history of our institution is that this school was started to educate African-American men to be prepared for the holy ministry. How do I convince, because it hasn't been easy, but how do you convince our religious studies department that our special collections are tied into what they do as we're showing them that you're teaching religious studies, but we were founded on teaching men to be ready for the holy ministry and being able to make that even into a digital presentation? I think that um, I would say this across anything, but you know, no offense, gentlemen, but you know, men can be stubborn. <laughs> but um, I would say the important- And I am showing, talking to a head who is a man. <laughs> I think the importance of showing them and maybe you show them by not, um, maybe you show them by looking outside of their subject area. The opportunity to say, look, what has happened, what we were able to do in terms of, you know, history or some other humanities area. But I think also I'm a real believer in appealing to the competitive nature um, that has it's in different sizes, in each person. But we all have a streak of it. And I think if to show them to model and help them to understand well, let me show you what another institution has done with their religious studies program and mm -hmm. their religious holdings. Mm -hmm. And let them ooh and ah for that for a minute. Okay. And then pull it back and say, now let me show you and bring out that document, bring mm -hmm. out that manuscript and put it in the Now let me show you this. And, and then ask them, how do you think this might help you to do your job? Okay. So I'm a real 
advocate of showing them up. Well, thank you so much for that. I think that is perfect. And I'm going to take your advice. So let me check the Q&A and see what else we have. So um, the first one says that uh, Ithaca quote is powerful as it is as is this presentation. You touched upon this in a broad sense, but what specific and immediate actions can we, particularly librarians and archivists, take to try to get the level of support and buy-in from the admin and, and accreditation levels? So basically from your higher mm -hmm. levels and accreditation. So it's not a one-time effort. It, it is something you need to do over and over, you need to become not a pest. You know, you don't want people to close the door when they hear you're coming down the, down the hall. But the importance of restating the case and your value over and over and over again. I do think that, thank you for that question. If I do think that, I do think that we are challenged with the job of establishing credibility for our profession. I do think that it's important for us to let our administrators know what we are about. They all have very historic, traditional, in, in most cases, perceptions of the work of the library and the archives. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you have to do, take steps to build appreciation for the work you do. You need to, you know, throw it, talk about it. You need mm -hmm. to, sh they need to see the, the, the back room, so to speak, of preservation mm -hmm. and the back room of digital projects and what it takes so that the appreciation for what you're bringing to the table, table is understood. But that has to be done over and over. So that's why I say, you know, communication is, is important and presence is important as well. Thank you so much. So there's a lot going on in the chat. Um, seems like there is an answer to this question, but I will pose it to you, um, being the CEO. Has anyone written a history of Clark Atlanta University School of Library and Information Science outside of the archives at AUC Woodruff? Are there other online resources? Um, I'm not specifically aware of other online resources, although I'm sure there's something out there. Um, I have not taken the time to look at that. Um, I do not, um, there has, to my knowledge, there is not a formal history written about the Sliss School at CAU. We here in our collection do have some materials, you know, the annual reports and that kind of institutional history from, um, from the university. So there may be something there. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for writing it. It's kind of interesting. I just had a conversation yesterday with the president of CAU, Dr. George French, who was talking to me about um, the need for the education and degree of librarians. So we'll see. Okay. All right. The next one is, what thoughts do you have about the use of artificial intelligence? And then it says, on the one hand, some people feel uneasy, intimidated by its use in academic spaces because of intellectual property and plagiarism among students. And on the other hand, one would argue it helps level the playing field for historically disenfranchised folks who struggle researching and organizing their ideas, having capacity in their workloads and applying to reputable research opportunities. My, my uh, short response to this, so when you talk about AI, I think most of us are immediately are thinking about this chat GPD um, AI that's out there that's, you know, can write papers for students, et cetera. But, you know, there has always, there have always been resources out there to help students who uh, want help in a, in a uh, non-traditional way, I will, I'll use that term, you know. Um, who don't want to do the work per se themselves, but look to find it elsewhere. So you can't fight that. What I think about artificial intelligence is it's here, and we need to understand it's coming, and it's going to be more and more of it. 
And what we really should do is figure out as a profession is figure out a way to get engaged in it and ahead of it. This is the kind, you know, when the Googles and the Internet Explorers and all those were first coming on, on uh, uh, around libraries, we were all kind of, you know, concerned about these search engines, which were going to replace librarians. But we didn't really do anything radical about it within the profession. We just stood on the curve and watched this, this thing, this monster grow and capture skills that we had been able to hold close and deliver it and put them in the hands of our, of our constituents. Same thing with self-service. Self-service is happening all around us. I mean, grocery stores, passport, uh, global entry, you know, into the airport, uh, car washing. Um, I, even the other day, I took my granddaughter to get a driver's ed and it was a virtual test. They put us in the car and, and the driver's ed person stayed inside and they put these devices in there to watch us and talk to us self-service industry. Yet, in our libraries, we are hesitant to do that because we want to hold on to the traditional model circulation desk. And I simply need to say, think to suggest, I'm just maybe going well beyond your question, but I think there's an opportunity for us to give some radical thinking to that. We, we have to not fear change. We can't fear artificial intelligence. We need to figure out a way to embrace that and make it work for us. And then educate our students about it. Thank you so much for that answer. I do agree. Um, and even at my library, we've been having more talks around that um, piece of artificial intelligence. So that was very helpful. Um, I do not see any other questions. Let me scroll down. Oh, here we go. It says, you mentioned rethinking staff roles in your slides. Can you share your thoughts on that point and what specific challenges perpetuate stagnation in staff roles, in your opinion? What perpetuates stagnation in staff roles is our reliance and comfort with doing things as we <laughs> always have done. It's so much easier, you know? I know. I, I come into work some days, I feel like that. It's so much easier just to kind of go with the flow. But that doesn't move our institutions and our profession and our student success along. It does not. It means we are accepting being mediocre and we must not. Um, rethinking staff roles. So, you know, at this point, um, again, I'm going to step on some toes. Do we really need to have the traditional departments we've always had? You'll, we will all remember that there was a time when we had to have two, three, or four full-time catalogers in our show. We don't have that anymore. You know, you may have, in our case, we have a half-time catalog who gives attention to materials in special collections. But there's all, of, all the other is our purchase services. I think that we need, in terms of rethinking staff roles, we need to think more clearly toward staff that need, that can, that have or can grow into digital experts. And we need to couple that also, the other arm to me, is in the instruction. So what is it, how can instruction, which is really mission central, how can instruction really work with our skills and our services and our capacities to digitize and to make things virtually accessible? How do those come together to help define this, this environment in our libraries now that will really advance student success? And it also means, it might mean, as has been said, um, in years past, certainly by one of our colleagues, David Lewis said it in his book years ago, um, that the idea is maybe we should stop getting hung up on the idea that we have to hire a professional librarian for every position. We don't, but then we have to know how to orient and, and insert the values of our profession into those who are working with us who might not hold that same pedigree degree. Um, so it's, we cannot be fearful of the change. 
because if we are, then we're going to be closing our doors soon. You know, our libraries will be taken over the other academic services. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. We have another question in the chat that states, what role do you see for Black library and special collection staff who come from work at PWIs? And when they say come from, they mean educated at or work at PWIs? Uh, I mean, the first thing is that they need to be our cheerleaders. They need to be cheerleaders of those of us in the HBCUs and not naysayers. Um, for, because there's a lot of misinformation out there about HBCUs and about working in the HBCU. Um, I think that also other Black librarians, I go back to building bridges and partnerships and ways that we can um, you know, work together. And if you're adding a, a PWI, et cetera, you're the cheerleader there. You know, you're the one that has opportunity perhaps to feed into the thinking about new partners or new messages, or you're the one that can say to the, the uh, instruction librarian, well, here's a collection that maybe they don't know about, you know, at Prairie View College, or here's a collection at St. Augustine's College that has materials that may be of value, and let's use that in our instruction. So I think that you, I go back to, have the opportunity to become cheerleaders um, and advocates, and in the best way, in that, in that environment that so needs to hear this accuracy. Okay, so I think I have time for one more. And it says, you spoke a little about growing generational shift in our workforce. What are some tips for millennial librarians to both learn from and bridge the gap between or across the Gen X and Gen Z? I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, I think the biggest tip is that we really have to listen to one another and not get so um, and, and not get, allow ourselves to get blocked into positions of entitlement by virtue of our generation. Um, the generations are very different. We baby boomers are so different from the Gen X, Y, Z, Alpha, capital P, yada, yada, yada. Um, so very different. But at the, at the root of all this, I think you always, you know, the way we, the way we cope or the way we deal with one another is by listening. We must listen to one another, not be on the attack all the time, um, not be on the why not, and more so on the but why, can't we, why don't we? You have to be, we have to be part of problem solving. Everyone has a role in that. And we have to understand that not have the expectation that you know all about me or that I know all about you. It, it's education, it's career long, lifelong learning. Um, it's emotional intelligence, you know, that self-awareness and that social awareness, which is so critical. You can't build bridges, you can't be in groups, you can't advance, you can't do anything if you're not very aware of where you are and where you're coming from and what you're, um, your strengths and weaknesses are, what your capacities and your skills are, what your preferences are, and same, same, understanding how others respond and react to them. So that's, there's, that's kind of a nonspecific, but um, that's a hard question. And good luck. <laughs> Okay, now I did say that we were wrapping up with this um, last question that you just answered, but there's one more, if we could just squeeze that in really quickly. It says, do you have any advice um, while building and growing a digital archive with the intent to be used at universities in terms of things to do or not to do? No, because I think that the response to that, I, I'm not sure about your question, but I think that the response to that lies firmly in the technical um, application area. And I'll be quick to say that's not, that's not my 
I'm a little out of my lane in that. But as a manager, as a supervisor, the to-dos I would say about growing that digital archive is that there's always, I think it's important to stay focused on why we're, why we're growing that archive and who we are growing it for. I think it's important also to um, engage our constituents along the way. I think that um, at the university, you know, faculty can get real excited about what we're doing if we um, engage them along the way, not at the end of the process, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Yeah, that's my thinking there. I'm sorry. Well, thank you so much, Mrs. Parham. This has been a wonderful session. Thank you to our audience for those engaging questions. Um, we are going to end this session now. Again, thank you to everyone who has been here. And there's other sessions. Please, by all means, join those and enjoy. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.